Good morning to our virtual audience. Um, we're happy to be back for our fourth virtual town hall meeting pan and panel discussion. Um, this is sponsored by the City of Steamboat Springs and Route County government um, in partnership with the Steamboat Pilot in today. Um, I'm the editor, Lisa Slitchman, and I'll be moderating uh, the panel today. Uh, today's panel will answer questions about COVID-19 testing as well as the new statewide stay-at-home order that the governor issued Wednesday. Um, we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in and introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Steamboat Springs City Council President Jason Lacey, Route County Commissioner Beth Melton, and Route County Public Health Officer Dr. Brian Harrington. Um, again, thank you all for being here. I know you're extremely busy, and so we appreciate your time. We're going to start off and kind of divide up the questions. The first portion is going to be about the stay-at-home order, and the second will focus more on testing and hospital capacity. Um, and as in uh, previous panels, I will ask a question to one person, and then you all please chime in as you see fit. So let's start off. Um, and again, these questions have been sent to us from the community. Um, so here's a very personal question. What are the recommendations for outdoor exercise or taking my kids on a bike ride? I know not to congregate with others, but when I've gone running in the morning, I see others doing the same. So now I'm getting paranoid, wondering if I should be staying in. Jason, do you want to? Sure, that one? I'll be happy to take that. So um, it, I know it can be really confusing with the current stay at home order to, to know what's allowed, what's not allowed because I think people have been reading so much information about stay-at-home orders that exist across the country, others across the world. So it's, I think it's important for people to understand this is not um, like a lockdown order. This uh, that you might see like in, we've seen in Italy and China and some other places like that. This is a stay-at-home order that has some very specific exceptions. And outdoor exercise is uh, one of the uh, critical functions that people are allowed to do. And it's important for people to be able to get outside so they can, you know, have, have better mental health, you know, to get outside and exercise, you know, stay healthy. That's so important for people to do that. But at the same time, it's very important for people to follow the additional guidelines that have been put in place by our local board of health and CDC guidelines, such as the social distancing that you keep hearing about. We need to even though we're outside and I know we all want to get together, we're all you know, maybe running out of some patience about you know, getting life back to normal, we need to follow those social distancing guidelines. We need to focus on not gathering with others uh, because again, I, you know, I know we, we wanna be social, we wanna you know, talk to our neighbors and our friends and, and gather, but following these guidelines are gonna help us uh, to get through this crisis much more quickly. So. Getting outside, getting your exercise, very important. You should, be, you should do that uh, whenever you can. Bring your children out, but just follow the, the SMART guidelines to not do the gathering. Follow the social distancing guidelines and, and get out and enjoy the out, outdoors. Thank you. Brian or Beth, anything to add to that? Um, I would echo everything Jason just said, and I just would summarize it that we want people to get outside and recreate, but um, we want you to do that with folks who reside in your household, mm -hmm. not with others right. um, in order to really maximize the, uh, the impact of the social distancing. Right. Thank you. Good? Okay. Um, next question. Um, under this new statewide order, what businesses are still open? Beth, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. So under the governor's order, um, there's a, a list of necessary functions, which includes um, going to work at necessary businesses. Generally speaking, um, those are health and safety um, it, uh, related, and really I'd refer people to our website, which um, is covid19routecounty.com, um, which will redirect you to um, an FAQ, there's an FAQ document that we've created 
There are some FAQ documents from the state as well as the full text of the order. Um, and so if you're a business owner trying to determine whether your employees should still come to work, um, if you're an individual wondering if you can leave your house for certain functions, that list is really going to be your best resource. Um, and after looking that, at that, if folks still have questions, they can call the Route County hotline, um, which is that 871-8444 number. And again, I think I would just mention as well that even for businesses that are allowed to be open, I think it's just really important, even at work, maintain the social distancing, follow the guidelines. That's something that even though your business or service may be listed as one of these essential businesses or services or critical functions, it's still very important to follow those guidelines when you're at work. And people can still do uh, takeout at restaurants. I know we get asked that a lot. That yes, is, okay. that, that's specifically exempted by the governor's order, and it was also exempted by the local order issued by the Board of Health. Okay, great. Um, next question. Um, so we have had a lot of orders um, that mm -hmm. have been announced, mm -hmm. um, and so we had the, um, the two public health orders that Route County passed that had to do with lodging and um, gathering size. Um, and then I think, if, I, if I'm not getting my days confused, the, that very night, um, the governor issued a statewide stay-at-home order. So how, what's changed from the two, you know, initial health orders to a statewide? Yeah, in, in short, um, as a reminder, our two orders were in relation to lodging and um, gatherings. Um, our lodging order is more restrictive excuse me, more restrictive than the state order, and therefore, under the state order, our more restrictive order um, supersedes what the state order says. So all short-term lodging is still closed. There is a list of exemptions that we created for folks who are local workers, for emergency situations. Um, and then in regards to the gathering order, the state's order, we consider to really be more restrictive. We had limited it to five people, but the state's order um, indicates that you cannot um, do anything that's on that list, that's not on that list of necessary activities. And so we would consider that to be more restrictive than that limit on gathering size. Um, in our gathering um, order, we also addressed restaurants and um, grocery stores and businesses and how those businesses should mitigate. Um, again, some of those businesses now would be not considered necessary under the state order, so they're now closed. Um, but the ones like the grocery store, the takeout, restaurants that are still open. We have our environmental health staff, which regulates those businesses, working closely with them to ensure that there are mitigation measures in place for social distancing. Um, and I think, I don't know, Dr. Harrington, I think you had some follow-up on that. Yeah, there's an important concept here with regards to limiting the spread of the disease to give us a chance to get control of it. The efforts we're making for our community are aimed at reducing the spread and containing it. And and we want to have a closed environment to do that. Our efforts are going to make a difference locally. But if we have people from our community who leave and go elsewhere, or if we have people coming from other communities, it disrupts that limit that we've placed in our community to control the spread of it. So it is pretty important as we try to contain this um, disease that we contain the influx of new cases while we're trying to control the ones that we already have. And, it, and this is a reciprocal issue. I, I don't point this just as them and us. No, this is important for us, too, for our other counties and places that we would go to. Um, it's just as important for uh, Denver or Grand Junction that we stay where we are and not go there unless we necessarily have a, a, an essential need. Great, thanks. Anything else, Jason? No, thank you. Um, Let's see, um, and that's a little bit, um, Brian kind of mentions, mentioned the influx of people, but we did have a very specific question from a second homeowner who wanted to know if they were allowed to come to their home in Route County. Um, so they're under our lodging order, that would not be covered. They, we wouldn't be restricting their access to their home, which they own here. 
Um, however, I would say exactly what Dr. Harrington said. Um, we, we don't want people coming in and out. Um, and I would suggest that there, the statewide order would really restrict people coming from somewhere else into Route County for recreational purposes, for vacation, to get away from the city. I don't think that that would be considered a necessary activity. Um, and therefore, I, I would believe that that type of um, travel would be prohibited. It's not so much them not coming to their home as them not traveling around the state. Um, and, and on that same point, I would just say that I know our second homeowners um, love Steamboat. They love the small community we have. And so our message to them at this time is we need you to help us keep our community safe um, by not coming at this time. And we will welcome you with open arms as soon as all of this is over. Um, but we really would ask for you to help us protect our community and our hospital um, by not coming. Yeah, and I'll touch on that further. Just I think every community is concerned about their medical capacity to handle a surge of sick patients. And we are a better positioned than many, I would say the majority of rural communities in Colorado to handle that, but there's still a limit to that. And I think every community is gonna be strained if they get into that situation. But we're conscious of the fact that we don't want to add on huge numbers of extra people here who might be ill and further strain our limited local resources. Yeah. And I would just echo what Beth said. It's, it's really important uh, right now to limit your travel as much as possible because that's just the smart move for your health and for the entire community's health. Uh, you know, this is not a, it's not an us versus them. It's not a fear of outsiders type thing. It's really just us trying to do the smart things to help limit the spread of this virus so we can keep it under control and support our hospital in its ability to respond if, if any surge in activity were to occur for the virus here. Makes sense. Um, another specific question. Um, I have a crew coming in for a construction project and I believe construction is still considered an essential business. Mm -hmm. So can that crew stay in lodging here? Yeah, so they, they can. So local workers for construction projects are allowed uh, to stay in lodging. Um, the, the governor's stay-at-home order does provide a pretty uh, broad exemption for construction activities in general. Um, but again, what we're trying to do is minimize the in and out of the community. That's really, that's really the focus here is you know, the more people, whether it's second homeowners or any, any construction workers or anybody for that matter coming in and out of the community, that just creates additional risk both for those people and for the community here. So it's just, it, it is allowed for local workers, again, who are working on construction projects, but beyond that, it's, it would be limited. And I'd like to just, this isn't related to the lodging question, but to construction in general. On those construction sites, it's still required that they are able to maintain those social distancing requirements. Um, that's in both our local order and the state order, that mm -hmm. any necessary activities still have to um, comply with those requirements. And so any construction site where that's not possible due to square footage and the number of people, um, those sites would, would need to take appropriate measures to have less people on site, for example, um, or cease that, that work. Um, one question that came in a little bit before this started, um, and I think Beth, I'll direct this to you. Yep. Um, have Route County commissioners considered closing access to backcountry trails in the county in order to minimize injuries that would require hospitalization and COVID-19 exposure for search and rescue team members? Um, so we believe that's not our authority. That would be the authority of the federal government in this, in Route County. Um, the majority, if not all, of that, the backcountry access is on Forest Service or BLM land. Um, and so that's not county authority to do that. Um, we would discourage folks from being in a situation where they're likely to get injured, even if that is something that you typically would feel comfortable doing um, in the, in the backcountry, because we need our first responders to be available 
um, for other needs. And so um, I would encourage folks to maybe um, exercise significantly more caution than you typically would when recreating um, to avoid going far into the back country. And um, if you do that, make that decision um, to be familiar with the backcountry ethics, which includes the, um, the ability and the commitment to self-rescue if needed. Um, we really can't afford to have resources out in the backcountry trying to rescue and provide medical care for folks. Thank you. Just as an add-on add on that, um, the city is keeping its parks and trails open generally. Um, playgrounds are not to be used right now, and picnic shelters are not to be used right now. Obviously, those are high-touch areas that we want people to avoid. But the core trail is open. Um, our other trails, with conditions permitting, depending on muddy conditions and things like that, those are open. We are continuing to keep uh, Howlson Hill open, and we're grooming it as we can to, for the Nordic Trails to keep that open for people. So uh, the city, we're planning to keep the, the parks and trails here open as much as we can so people can get, get outside and exercise again, as we discussed earlier. And I guess I would mention that um, Steamboat Resort is closed to Correct. uphill access as well. Right. So just remind people of that. Right. Um, Dr. Harrington, I'm going to ask this next question. We get, um, we've gotten quite a few questions from people who um, still think that all of this is an overreaction. So um, how would you respond to that? We all understand that. I've had thoughts in the past, too, about, oh, my gosh, do we need to shut down the whole country like this? Is that exactly the right thing? But I've evolved on that. I now believe that we are not overreacting, and let me explain that. Um, I guess I might even use a parallel to when I see somebody in clinic. Uh, we, you know, you can see a patient, they have symptoms, you have concern of something, and you do a bunch of tests. You order CT scans, do all this stuff. You kind of want to find something, but really you don't. We want to have the situation here where we've done all this and we didn't need it. I don't want to have the situation where we needed it. So I hope that we get through all this and we say, gosh, we did all that and we didn't need it. I think um, it's true that we can kind of talk and compare this to other violences like influenza. Right now in the world, the total deaths in the world are only just approaching the total of influenza deaths in the U.S. this year. So I, that's a contextual point. Uh, but, we're, but flu is a different thing. It's spread out through the season. Many of us have partial immunity. We have a vaccine. We even have a medicine that works for it a little bit, you know, the Tamiflu type stuff. We don't have any of that with this illness, with, with COVID-19. And we're not able to deal with all of us getting it at the same time. So I think we don't, um, I, I don't think we need to debate how serious it can be. We have examples of Italy. We have examples of New York City now. I mean, I have people I know there. It's, it's, um, it's, it's tough. There are things going on there that um, I did not expect to happen in, in America with health care and care of people. So it's a very real threat. It could happen here. I'm a glass half full guy. I believe we're going to get through this, and it's not going to be that absolute worst case scenario. But by golly, we've got to prepare for that worst case scenario. And so I do not think we're overreacting. I think we are preparing for the worst and hoping that at the end of it, we over prepared. Yeah, and I'll follow up on that as well. Um, I don't think we're overreacting either. Um, I, I think, you know, as Dr. Harrington mentioned, there are a lot of places that wish they had taken measures earlier to prevent a lot of the uh, sickness and death that they're seeing uh, across the world. Italy, for, for example, is one in New York City now as well. Um, I also feel that, um, and, and believe me, I, I know that this, these decisions were really hard for all the governors that have made them, the county commissioners as in their roles, the Board of Health to issue their orders, because everyone recognizes the terrible economic effect that it will have in the short run, and we, we don't minimize that by any means. But I also feel that by taking these measures now, we will actually allow our economic recovery to happen earlier than it would if we drag this out and didn't take the measures now to, to get this virus under control. So while it is painful, I totally recognize that. I know there are a lot of people out there that they don't, they don't, they don't have a job now. They, they're wondering if they're going to keep their business. You know, they're wondering if, you know, how, how are they going to keep a roof over their head right now? There, there are people really concerned out there. 
I truly feel that by taking these steps, we are going to allow the other side, which will get here, and the recovery to happen much sooner. Thank you. And I'm one person's opinion, but I have a lot of confidence in the process that's gone on here in Route County and Moffat County in terms of how our decisions are made. There's no impulse reactions here. There are no impulse reactions. All of these decisions have been discussed in numerous meetings over many days and weeks. There's nothing that's been impulsive. So I, I applaud the leaders of our city, our counties, for being deliberate in their decision making and I think really incorporating a lot of various viewpoints. So to the point, I don't think anybody's overreact. If I could also just add one comment, I think, you know, folks say, well, I, if I get sick, it's really not that big a deal, or I know some of these cases are mild. And I, my opinion, I invite Dr. Harrington to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you're probably right that if one person, you, gets sick, it's, it's not that big of a deal unless you're in one of those vulnerable populations. And really, it's not about one person getting sick, it's about all of us getting sick. And it's about those folks who are vulnerable because of their age or their immunocompromised or whatever it is. We want to protect those people and we want to protect our systems. We want the hospital systems, the medical care um, cannot uh, take a huge surge of a lot of people getting sick at the, one, at the same time. So it's not about you, one person getting sick, it's really about this community ethic, um, and that's what public health is, is, is the health of the public in general. It's not about one person's medical or health care. It, it's really about the community. And so I would encourage people to try to understand that. Um, and I think the example that is really sticks with me, which both of you alluded to, but to just be a little more explicit about it, in Italy, they had to make a decision that if you're over a certain age, you don't get care anymore. Um, you are, are left to die. And I don't think any of us want to be in that situation. And so that's the kind of consequence that we're talking about. It's not an individual getting sick. It's really about protecting each other in our community. Right. That's exactly so. From many individual perspectives, this is going to be an overreaction in the sense of they personally, they're okay. But from a community of people, this is not an overreaction. And if we look at this as what we're doing together for each other and taking care of each other, this is what we have to do. Um, we're going to shift now, um, probably putting the focus on Dr. Harrington and focus on testing. So, um, how, so we have a very specific question. How many people have been tested in Route County? How many have tested positive? How many tests have come back negative? And how many tests are you waiting on? So I think that demonstrates, you know, people still wanting those numbers. Right. Uh, the test process is constantly evolving. We have, this morning as I checked, um, we've had 220 tests done in Route County. So you could say that that represents uh, just shy of 1% of our population, right? About 24,000 or so. Uh, that is an inadequate amount. I wish we could be testing more. Uh, currently our testing is focused on certain criteria. We kind of have two channels for testing. Uh, the hospital testing process is following uh, the recommended criteria of uh, we test uh, some of our hospital patients, and if they have it, then that might dictate some care decisions. Um, but it, then the larger group that's getting tested uh, through the hospital process is healthcare workers. We want to maintain the healthcare workforce, so they've been prioritized on the on the test test scheme, if you will. That process has been sped up. We're now seeing results back sometimes within 24 hours. That's much different than what it was a couple of weeks ago although there's still cases that we've submitted in the past that are somewhere and we're waiting on them. Uh, we have another process to the state public health department that I and our uh, county public health department can avail ourselves of. We're able to sometimes get um, some test uh, supplies here and when we get those we use them for our contact tracing. So we are able to do some limited contact tracing. And I can explain that briefly too. When we have a positive case, we immediately are contacting that person and creating a list of close contacts. Now, obviously that's gonna be anybody that lives with them, but it may be people that they um, have certain work connections with that they spend a lot of time in close contact. 
we then issue isolation orders to the person who's got a positive test. And in addition, we issue quarantine orders to those people that are identified as close contacts. Um, and we do sometimes, if we have test capacity, we do try to test a few of those people to try to track that down. As a public health person, that's been frustrating that we can't do that. That's bread and butter public health stuff and that's not been a uh, ability that we've had with this disease. We are somewhat dependent on people's veracity, their truthfulness and telling us who their close contacts are. Um, that can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, but we do our best to track down who all those people are. We give a message out on what they need to do to um, restrict their contact with other people. The testing process, I think, is going to continue to ramp up. Uh, I, at some point, uh, I even expect our hospital will have capacity here, but that probably is a month or more away. We are still limited by the actual reagents, the chemicals, the buffers, the things that go into doing a PCR test. And until that becomes more widespread, we're limited. I can tell you that many entities here in town, we've tried some of the private clinic um, uh, venues. There are some private vendors and they are ramping up. That has not proven to be very successful. We've tried that. I've still got tests that we've sent out that aren't back yet from some of the private vendors. Um, so whichever direction we've gone, it's not been, it's not met what I think all of us hope it would be. Okay, thank you. Any, Jason? Um, I guess I was just, I think folks would appreciate uh, the most recent numbers if you know those. I, I know they're changing constantly. Right, so we're at 15 Route County residents who are positive. Okay. We've tested 220. And we have um, over half of those back now. So you know we've had quite a few uh, negatives. I'm sorry, I don't know our, our count right before I walked in here. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful that that backlog starts to catch up with the ones we have outstanding. Um, it's, yes, it, it, to make this testing useful, you'd want to know here and now. We sometimes find out somebody is positive um, a week after. Now, when we test somebody, they are given isolation um, orders or, or guidelines to follow. So it, it, isn't, it isn't that we just let them continue around the community until we get the test result. But by the time we get a test result back on somebody a week later, mm -hmm. we've missed some chances to do some mitigation efforts in the community based on that case too. And, and maybe it's important, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, my understanding, people are frustrated obviously about the timing of the testing and the turnaround. Yeah. My understanding right now is that it's taking about seven days or so to get those test results back as they're usually being sent to CDPHE. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a variation of, of results, although this week I've seen some improvement. Okay. Uh, both the UC Health System, which we use necessarily because they're here in our community, and then even the CDPHE process, we're starting to get some of those back quicker. But I still have test results that are outstanding over a week out too. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't have, I, I, I see improvement. I see improvement, um, I hear messages that we have improvement, but because of those limitations, we continue to have um, pretty restrictive prioritization on, on who to test because we just don't have them. And I think I just, if I could um, emphasize that really all of that leads to why these um, social distancing and stay in home mm -hmm. situations are so critical um, because we're not able to do what we typically would wanna do in a public health situation where we follow the disease and can track right. exactly where people might be exposed. Mm -hmm. We have to assume it's everywhere mm -hmm. um, in order to really control it at this point. Right, and the measures, I think it's it's not only the testing, but you compound that with the facts that, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but symptoms can sometimes not show up for yeah. seven to 10 days or even longer in some cases. So when you have such a time delay between symptoms being shown and a delay on testing, that just exacerbates the reason why we need to take these measures. Exactly, we, we believe that maybe a majority of people who even contract this virus have almost no symptoms and may not even know they have it. Uh, so that's one of the areas that's been a gap. We're not able to just go out and do public screening and figure out who's carrying it and doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. We assumed here well over a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, I can't remember the exact day it popped in my mind, but we assumed at a point some time ago that it was spreading through our community. Mm -hmm. So at that point, um, we're kind of past the containment stage and then you're into this mitigation stage where you're trying to, trying to minimize it. Uh, and I also have to you know, acknowledge, we don't have any treatment for it. 
There's no medicine that works in spite of what we may be reading on social media. We don't have any treatment for it. If you find out you have it, it's not fundamentally any different from just being sick and being told to self-isolate. There's no extra medicine we do, there's nothing. So that, um, from a personal medical care standpoint, the testing doesn't modify the care we would give that person. Where it matters, again, is um, trying to do containment strategies in our community, and it matters socially for people getting back to work, people being able to function. Um, I wish we could tell people, you don't have it, you're, you're good to go. Um, but we're not able to do that right now. And again, the providers in our community are very frustrated by this too. I wanna make sure that the, the frustration about testing isn't put on providers. I don't know a single provider that I've talked to in our community that, that agrees with um, this limited capacity that we have. They all wanna do more. And I think something too that's interesting is, um, you know, you do release the age of the people that test positive mm -hmm. and I think we see from that that it's all ages. It is. And I can tell you, we have older people who seem to have done quite well with it. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it's, it's all over the board. We're, we're all at risk, although I would, would acknowledge that the majority of the group, like 90 plus percent of almost all the deaths in the U.S. have been in the upper age ranges. However, in terms of hospitalizations, there appears to be some of a disproportionate amount who are actually under age 50. So, I mean, we're all at risk. Yeah. I, may I, I'm sorry, I know you want to get to the next question. No, I, no, I no. want to just <laughs> highlight, you know, Dr. Harrington um, identified the prioritization for first responders and healthcare providers, and I just want to connect the dots a little bit, that that's directly related to that idea of getting back to work. Those are folks that we need on the front lines, and so if there's any suspicion that they may have um, coronavirus, it's problematic to try to isolate them for 14 days. Um, and so that's why those folks are being prioritized to receive testing so that they can get back to work if they do not, in fact, have the virus. And, and on that same point, um, county announced yesterday they are doing a drive for personal protective equipment, PPE, yes. that you probably heard the acronym now many times. Um, but I think that's important. We're, uh, we are getting distributions from the national stockpile. We should be receiving some more soon, hopefully. Um, but in order to protect our community even better, we need to take care of those first responders and healthcare workers so they can keep us well. So um, please, if there's any way that you have any access to any of that personal protective equipment, please call the county. Um, I think it's being coordinated through the um, the hospital, mm. and we can provide that content. I don't have it right in front I of me, but we I think it's Karen Schneider through That's the right. Community Foundation. That's right. Yes, so Thank you. um, you're right. Yeah, and I know I found it interesting that construction companies, the, the protective masks, I think, also are the same kind that the hospital could use. Is that correct? Yeah, and there's different situations when you use different PPE. Yeah. Um, but we're, um, yes, we're trying to be prepared for potentially a huge surge and we would be using that equipment a lot. Yeah. Okay, um, another very um, good question. Have we done enough testing in Route County to make a credible statistical projection of the total number of infections here? If so, what is that looking like currently? No, we do not or have not that okay. information. Uh, the, we're using surrogates for that. Okay. So the surrogates for that are, um, well, community spread. You know, when you have, when we had a case where we couldn't say for sure where they got it, okay. So to be in the community and get it that way, there has to be some incidents in the community. We, uh, I certainly pay attention to how many cases we get each day. You know, that's a little difficult to judge just because we've had slowly increasing capacity for testing. If we do more tests, we're gonna have more positives. Uh, but the fact remains, we have more people in our community testing positive and we're finding them. Um, we are looking at some ways that we might be able to um, assess that, especially, you know, we're gonna get on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. And when we get on the other side of this, we're still gonna have public health actions that we need to take to make sure we're okay and how do we release restrictions. And if we don't come to a point where we have widespread testing, we need to have other ways to um, t um, understand that. Um, we're talking about some ways of trying to gather information from the public about symptoms. Just because your symptoms doesn't mean you have uh, coronavirus, but we might be able to use that as one way of judging uh, what the incidence of disease in the, is in, in, the, in the community. So we're working on ways of having patients self-report that like they're doing in Eagle County. But that's still a work in progress. Okay. 
Um, I'm, this is another question you, I think, maybe have answered a little bit, but I'm wanting to better understand what our path is to obtaining sufficient testing resources and what is blocking that. Lisa, let me just answer the previous question. I was texting my public health partners oh, okay, just to great. get the most accurate numbers. We currently have 110 negative tests in Route County. Okay. And we have 94 pending. Okay. Um, we just did several, the public health department just here the past couple days did um, maybe close to 70 extra tests that we got from, from the county on some of our contact tracings. Um, so that's part of that jump. So those are the numbers. Okay. Um, so you asked me the question again. Um, it was about um, the, was um, yeah. you know, are we on a path to obtain a sufficient testing resort resources and what is blocking that? Yeah, I, I see at least four pathways for testing. So one is to the state public health department. Mm -hmm. um, the other that um, all communities have, if they have a hospital, is the local hospital and whatever system they're part of. So we have the UC Health System. We have private labs, uh, LabCorp is one that some places use around here. And then we might end up getting some other kind of private sources or people who have maybe the technical ability and aren't typically in that realm. And we, we're talking with those people and, and doing our best to explore other options. Uh, so each of those has been on their own pathway and I would suggest that the Private entities and UC Health, I think, have the best chance of getting a robust testing capacity in the closest time frame. Uh, and the issue remains, well, it's actually two things. It is the reagents, so this uh, PCR testing requires specialized made chemicals to do stuff with the DNA and to PCR, do that. PCR? PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Okay. Um, and that process is uh, pretty fascinating science, but you take it, it takes a small amount and amplifies it so that you can actually determine what's there. And it has to do with almost reverse DNA engineering. You're taking RNA transcriptase and other um, parts that make the DNA function and you kind of back engineer from that to make a bunch of the DNA, which would then match with what we know as the virus DNA and say, ah, oh, here we go. But that chemical process takes a bunch of buffers and reagents and, and base chemicals to make it work. Um, so that's half the issue and that's probably been the most limiting step. And then we discovered that we didn't have that many viral containers. I mean, when you do the swab, it has to be maintained in a special viral medium and it has to be collected with a certain type of swab. And then that goes to have the test done. Well, it turns out we quickly ran out of those test collection materials. And at times that's been a little bit of a rate limiting step too. And quite frankly, that's one of our rate limiting steps here is we just don't have that many test kits that we're able to do it with. Uh, so both of those are a manufacturing process, they're an engineering process. Uh, we just frankly started late in our country in getting those um, resources prepared. And uh, it's, I mean, it's not a blame game, but you know, I, I look at it and I mean, I'm gonna ask myself, why didn't I think of this? We've had all these viral epidemics come up. We had SARS in 2002, we had H1N1 that we got concerned about in 2009, we had MERS in 2012, we had Ebola a few years ago. These are all viral epidemics. So the template was there. And if, if I had ever thought about it, I would say, gee, if we had it here, what we'd need to do? We'd need to do viral testing. Oh, well, how much of that would we do? How many supplies would we need? We clearly weren't, as a, as a country, ready for that. And um, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready myself for it. I could talk about that. That's super interesting. It is. <laughs> really, yeah. really, really. really. Um, let's see. Um, okay, once again, we've had questions about why the county isn't releasing a detailed list of exactly where infected patients were leading up to their diagnosis. And there is um, that ongoing frustration. It, it, I mean, it's an ongoing question. I get that. Yeah. Um, boy, there's, lot, there's lots of ways that play into that. Why identifying a location in most situations, frankly, doesn't matter. Um, this is a disease spread by close interpersonal contact, less so by physical contact. We believe, and this is what all the national and international experts say, that it's usually breathing in the fomites and particles. So if you're next to somebody and you're talking, you're coughing, you breathe over their food, that's how you're, you're, you're contracting it. The issue of touching a surface certainly can be a relevant way of catching it, but we know that virus doesn't live too long on those surfaces. So for in our situation, when we get a test back a week later and so forth, 
we're past the point of closing down a business. We've done that in a, in a handful of situations where the timing of the test allowed us to do that. The, uh, and now that we know it's widespread in the community as well, that, um, that kind of lessens any benefit of closing a particular place, you should assume it's everywhere and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. And that's why we've put out the recommendations for uh, you know, the personal things that you do to keep things out of your mouth and eyes, to, not, to wash your hands all the time, to keep your social distancing. That's what matters. I can tell you that the cases I've read, both um, statewide and, and nationally, and I think I touched on this last week, when you, when you look at these case contacts that turned up positive, they had contact with the people in a, in a close contact setting. And yet it wasn't an issue of somebody being in, in location on Monday and then somebody being in that location on Tuesday and getting the disease. No, you're physically there with the other person who's sick with it. And so we weigh that. Um, given that we don't believe that knowing the location makes a big difference, we also, uh, there are some privacy things that come to play. We're not supposed to release information that might identify um, people as a patient. And then um, we don't think that um, the livelihood of some of our people in our community, the people that need to put food on their table and all that, should be negatively impacted by something that doesn't seem to matter in terms of that location issue. Um, I want to highlight one thing that Dr. Harrington said, just to pull it out a little bit. Um, it's that close contact with other people. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to be concerned about folks having sleepovers, right. inviting people over to their house for a party. Dinner party. Dinner. Right. Yeah. Um, that is how you're going to end up spreading the virus, is being in those kind of settings, not going to a restaurant two days after someone else was there, or even, right. quite frankly, at the same time as them. It's that close contact with other people. And so, it, obviously, we have limited ability to monitor what's happening in people's personal residences, mm -hmm. but that's where the spread is going to happen, and that's why it's so critical to not do those things. Yeah, and that's, that's something that our uh, police chief wanted me to emphasize today as well, and you heard from him in our town hall on, on Wednesday. Um, overall, the community seems to be reacting pretty well to this right now. However, um, he is hearing more reports about these gatherings in neighborhoods and, you know, other families getting together and having sleepovers and play dates and things like that. And, you know, obviously we, law enforcement has limited resources. We can't be scouring every neighborhood every hour or something like that. That's not, that's not the goal. But so that's why it's really important for everyone to do their part and really take these measures seriously. Limit the, don't do the gatherings, keep six feet apart. It's, it's really important so that way we can stop, stop these cases from spreading in the community. And I would add something that our readers will notice is we are keeping track of how many cases, but we're no longer going to send out a breaking news alert. Mm -hmm. Um, we will, you know, we'll keep, I think we're going to embed the county dashboard on our website so people will know, but we, that's, we believe the focus needs to be on the mitigation um, and not be so focused on who has it um, right. and to, and there should not be a stigma with it because chances are we, right, right. a lot of us have it. So yes. do you want to point that out for our readers? They may be frustrated. They'll see the information, but we're not going to, to, you know, push it out quite as big as we did at the very beginning. So. Um, let's see, um, something we do, and you mentioned it, but I think, um, can you explain the process of contact tracing? Right. So we'll get, a, we'll get notice of a positive test, then, and we have public health nurses on the um, public health department staff who are immediately reaching out to that person who, and, and making sure they've been notified of the result, and then quickly generating a list of close contacts. And, you know, that's somewhat defined as people who are within six feet for a prolonged period of time. But we don't quite follow it strictly that way. We want to just make a determination of who is in close contact with you. Now, that's obviously going to be anybody that lives with them. So anybody who lives with a positive test is automatically going to be requested quarantine. Um, isolation is the term you use when you're infected or you're sick with something. Quarantine is a word that we apply to somebody who could be infected. We don't know. And we want you to stay away from others. Then we start working our way out in a circle from there. Where have you gone? Who have you been with? Were you riding with somebody? Do you um, share a cubicle space with somebody? And then from those contacts, we then uh, reach out to them. We will give uh, quarantine orders to other close contacts. Um, when we've been able to get tests from the state, we will sometimes do some close contact testing. 
and we've done that. Um, I would even say that we've found a couple positive cases that way, um, not a surprise. In fact, now I assume if you, uh, if, a, if a person is positive and a fellow family member has symptoms of respiratory illness, I assume that that's another positive case. And frankly, I don't even have to test that. I mean, that, that's just, we're gonna assume that. But, um, so then we work our way out from those cases. And if we could test everybody, it would be much easier for us to say, yep, you need to be isolated. No, you can go back on your stuff. So instead, if you're a close contact, and especially when we don't have the testing capacity, we just give out an order and say you need to remain in isolation or in quarantine. And again, the quarantine thing is if you don't necessarily have symptoms, but we're gonna to wait to see if you develop them. And that's typically considered to be a 14 day period. Anyone else? Well, I think um, actually, I know you and I spoke about this after our panel the other day, that I think um, it, one of the pieces of somewhat reassurance to folks is if you are, if you have been in close contact with someone who tests positive, then the likelihood is that you will be informed of that via this contact tracing process. So I think that's a, maybe a point of reassurance for our community members. Mm -hmm. And the public health department here, uh, Carrie Ledwell and our nurses, Michelle Lewis, we have some contract nurses working. Uh, I mean, they're working very hard at this and we are still doing things that the state now suggests we may not need to. In, in a statewide approach, there's a, some decisions about where the uh, resources can best be applied. We still feel in our community that um, generating contact lists and, and reaching out to them and testing when we have the capacity is still relevant to our community and so we are still um, aggressively trying to do that. Great. Okay. Um, Let's see, um, if we only had, um, I, I'm, I can't even remember, I think we're at 15 cases, is that right? My last so count, yeah. If we have only 15 confirmed cases, and I use that word only, why is there such a state of alarm? Yeah, um, this would go back to our previous discussion point too, just how do we know? Uh, we know enough to know it's present in our community, it's here, it's growing, and you can look around, you can look at the state numbers. We are on the acceleration phase, meaning we're getting more, more, it's growing exponentially in terms of the amount of cases that we identify, and therefore the amount of cases that we have um, even unidentified in our community. Some percentage of those people are gonna become critical. And I'm waiting any day for us to maybe get that, that hospitalized patient, somebody who dies from it. And uh, I, again, it's kind of, you know, you want to be at that point where you're prepared for it and say, well, we overprepared. I don't want to be at that point where we go, gosh darn it, we should have done more. Mm -hmm. And so everybody at this point, I believe, is, is working their best to be as prepared as we can. I know as, and I've quoted this before, what's the patent quote or something, you know, the best plans, you know, war evaporate on contact with the enemy or something like that, you know, and so I, ac I, I, I accept that we're gonna, come up on it and, and still have things that we need to be working on. But boy, a lot of work. I'm, I'm, it's really impressive to see our, um, our leaders, our city, our county officials, um, everybody, whether it's the newspaper here, or whoever, people, everybody's pitching in and trying to do their best. There's effort going on and we should take heart from that. I think this is um, also a good opportunity to just remind folks about the county's emergency operations functions. Um, and we have mutual aid that's provided by the city, by um, other entities across the county, by our fire districts. And um, there's a preparedness and a recovery, uh, there's a preparedness, a response, and a recovery function that that group serves. And so to Dr. Harrington's point about um, preparing for the possibility of a surge in need at the hospital. I know they have a task force that's specifically working on logistics of what that would look like. Where could you put additional hospital beds? What supplies are available, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's just by way of example, one of the things that that group is doing and continuing to prepare for these various scenarios that would be of concern. Yeah, and, and to your point on your question, Lisa, with why the state of alarm, I I think, I think it's just exactly like Dr. Harrington said, it's, it's really, we're, we're trying to limit, obviously, that exponential growth that, that could occur and that we have seen across the country and around the world in certain places. I mean, there have been some pretty significant growth scenarios of, of cases in some of these communities that, again, didn't take these steps early enough. So 
that's why we're doing it. And, and it's also, you know, that, that's going to help us, you know, the, one of the buzzwords we, or phrases we've heard is the flattening of the curve. That's what we're trying to do is keep the number of people that might need our critical, you know, hospital and med medical resources to help handle their cases. We're trying to keep that as low as possible and not have that big jump, the big spike that could overwhelm our resources. So that's, that's, that's why I wouldn't call it a state of alarm. I, I would call it taking the right measures now so we can save as many lives as possible. An alarm is a natural response. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in a stressful situation. We have rapid change. We don't know or understand a lot, and we don't feel we have enough control over the situation. That just creates a, a, a condition of alarm. I, I feel alarm. We all have alarm. Mm -hmm. What will distinguish us as a community and individuals is how we channel that alarm. Mm -hmm. Have alarm for your neighbor. Have alarm for your community. Mm -hmm. um, we should have alarm for ourselves, but have a, how we channel that alarm can determine whether it's productive or counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Um, we do, we've had several questions about um, ventilators. There's a lot mm -hmm. of talk nationally about that. Um, so one of, one of our very smart readers did a lot of research and he determined if Route County with a population of 26 were average, we'd have five full featured ventilators and 13 total. Again, I'm not, a, he said he uh, got that based on a study published by the AMA. So how many do we actually have? Left? So we're actually right about at that calculation. Um, okay. Between the hospital and then the uh, Steamboat Emergency Center, which has some capacity too, um, right now it estimated our capacity to be at 10 okay. um, ventilators. There's a lot that goes into that. And it takes people to manage those. Um, there's other support equipment with it. And um, yeah, that's, that was kind of an early ID with our hospital was just, you know, what's our capacity for that in our rooms? Um, I can tell you that there's a personnel capacity for that. Uh, we, I am one of the providers, um, presumably, that would be involved with that if, you know, we have hospitalized patients and, and I happen to be working there, but we don't have an infinite number of nursing and, and physician staff. Uh, we do have a extra capacity at the hospital, which I think is a pretty neat deal that we actually just kind of started up this winter um, serendipitously. It's at the same time as this is coming on. A uh, virtual ICU system where the UC Health System has a, a room down in Denver with critical care specialists and nurses who sit monitoring the vitals of our critical care and intubated patients. And so they give us real-time feedback sometimes too. So uh, the hospital's got, I think, pretty robust capacity for that. Uh, and then uh, the emergency center has the ability to have a couple innovative patients too. But that needs to be part of a system of care. And that's, uh, as Beth was coming on, I think it's become a focus here in the last couple of weeks is that, that system of care if we get a large number of patients. Because we have to deal with COVID patients, but we still have people getting other illnesses, strokes, um, heart attacks, pneumonias, appendicitis, whatever. And so we, we have to figure out how we continue taking care of the medical need that's always going to be there. Then how do we move these patients around, and how do we make how do we make bed space? Well, do we do we have a step down place? So there's kind of like these four areas for that planning. You've got to have facilities, you've got to have support services. So if you have different places where people are, how do you give them food? You've got to have uh, personnel, and then you've got to figure out how this all flows. Where does the patient start? How do they end up? Um, so that process right now is is an active process, so that uh, we we have that plan in place that's going to support the community if we get to that point. Again, I hope we're overreacting. Mm -hmm. I hope that we get a big plan together and it all sits there empty. <laughs> Anything else on that? You all? No. Okay. Um, so there have been mixed messages about the importance of testing. Um, do we need to do mass testing or is testing irrelevant at this point? What is your thought on that? My personal thought is we need to do more testing. Okay. I absolutely believe that. Now, I don't believe that we have to do mass testing. If you do the right kind of testing, you can be selective enough that instead of doing 24,000, you do 1,000, for example. Okay. And then also, if we had the capacity to do uh, full public health testing where you could track every possible contact and test them and get a result back within hours, we could contain stuff. But that's not the, and I, we're not in that environment. So I believe that we need to have far greater capacity for testing. 
Um, I don't believe it has to be mass. I mean, if you look at other disease examples, we don't do mass testing for other illnesses, even say, again, influenza is an example. We could, but we don't, because that's not necessary. We have other markers for it, and its impact on the disease because of pre-existing exposure is spread throughout the community. Uh, we need more testing, period. I, I, I believe that, I say that, and uh, I expect that we will be at that point at some point in time. Not too long, I'm kind of hoping another month or two we'll have much more robust, robust capacity. Thank you. Um, I think we're down to our uh, last question, and then I want to give you guys an opportunity to kind of make any other statement you'd like to. Sure. Um, but we, um, what plans are in place to pre prepare for a potential surge of patients? That seems to be a point of, um, I think, anxiety for people. Mm -hmm. So, and so I was, yeah, trying to address that a little bit with the, um, yes. you know, the materials, personnel, and that stuff. And to that point, I want to ask people. If you have medical skills and think you can contribute to our community medical team, we are collecting names and skill sets, so we have a ready-made list, and that's being run through the United Way. We've already had people call us up and say, hey, I'm retired from this, I used to do this, I, uh, whatever, we can use you. Um, get your name on that list so that we can um, have that. A lot of this planning preparation, though, is, is, is outside of the hallways of any medical facility and has to do with how our community continues to function and how essential services continue to function. So I'll let you both answer that. Right. Go well, ahead, uh, yeah, well, I mentioned that um, we do have, this is a high priority item for our emergency operations center right now, um, which is creating that search plan. Um, and so there's a team of folks. Uh, the hospital obviously is involved in that. Um, as well as um, C-Mode Emergency um, and some other players. I'm not sure everyone who's on that list off the top of my head. Um, I know there have, as Dr. Harrington said, there's a discussion about what facilities are available. I know that list was generated a week ago and they've continued to work through the logistics of what those locations would be if mm -hmm. there were a need to set up hospital beds, that sort of thing. Um, I know that our emergency um, upper, our emergency manager, man, I don't, <laughs> words, um, our emergency manager um, has um, inventoried the supplies that we have available in, in both medical and non-medical, things like pillows, sheets, um, mm -hmm. yep. you know, cots, all those kinds of things. Those are things that we have a stockpile of for emergency response just in general. Um, and so there's been a process of inventorying those, um, moving them to a location closer into Steamboat. We typically store those um, out in Hayden. Um, and so um, those kinds of things are in progress. Obviously, as Dr. Harrington said, identifying personnel. Um, so I guess the short answer is we have a team that has this as a high priority and is working through all of those logistics in order to be prepared when or if um, this occurs. Yeah, and I think, I think it's also important to add the hospital always has, has a contingency plan for a surge in activity. They've, they've always had plans on, on, on the books, you know, in case some kind of surge were to occur at any time. So they, they have that in place, but also through, through all these uh, groups that are working on this and the sp specifically the task force, um, yeah, they, they, are, they are lining up facilities, um, equipment, supplies, and also you need staffing, you know, to, if, if, if there ever were to come to a point where you need to, you know, have those facilities in place, we'll need people to help. That goes to Dr. Harrington's point about if you have certain skills in the medical world that you might be able to contribute, please sign up, Route County United Way, and they'll, and they'll be glad to get you on the list. In the event that we ever get to that point where we actually need to go to those facilities and staff them up and equip them to help people. I guess that that will, I'd like you guys to maybe say something that maybe we didn't cover. So let's start with Beth and go this way. Sure. I don't know if I have anything we didn't cover, so I'll just <laughs> probably reiterate something we did cover, which is that um, this is really a time where we need the community to come together, not, uh, not physically, but um, in our support of one another. And what that looks like is, um, the very strictest interpretation of the stay-at-home orders of being um, 
just with the people in the in your immediate household to the greatest extent possible not uh, not necessarily saying well is this allowed or is it not allowed if you don't need to do it don't um, stay home um, work at home go out only when you absolutely need to um, please continue to take care of yourself to check in on your neighbors and your friends um, by phone and virtually um, go outside and recreate, um, but just with members of your household and um, just underscoring that message that this is a time for us to help and support one another and this is the way that we do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I always like to end on a positive note. Um, and, and for me, you know, people keep wondering, you know, how, how, how are we gonna get through this? You know, and when are we gonna get through it is, is what a lot of people ask. I can't answer the when part just yet. But the reason I know that we will get through it is because of the quality of the people that we have here in this community. Um, you know, I've, I know there are a lot of people out there that are, are struggling, I've mentioned it, you know, people may not be employed, may not be fully employed, they have a business, they're worried about paying their rent or their mortgage, Landlords worrying if they can pay their mortgage, um, you know, retailers, restaurants, lodging properties wondering if they're going to be able to keep things going. And, you know, I, I just look back to, I've been here long enough now to see us in this community go through really good times and really bad times as well. And when we hit those really bad times, I really have seen a lot of people step up. I've seen people do it time and time again, and I'm seeing it now. And it's, you know, it, you hear it from people when they visit here. So they tell us, wow, you have a real community. You have such great community character here. And it's hard for people to define what that means, but really it's about the quality of the people that live here. So that's why I'm encouraged. And that's why I know that, yeah, it, it's easy to focus on the bad news that you see. You can turn on the television or the radio or read in the newspaper at any time about all the bad stuff going on. There's a lot of good stuff too, and there are a lot of great people here that are gonna help us get through this. And I just want everybody to remember that. And I know it's gonna be hard. You know, it's gonna take a lot of patience. Um, some people, their patience is already wearing thin. We're gonna need more of that. And we need to just keep following these guidelines and, and orders so that way we can get to that other side more quickly. And, and I know that th this community is gonna keep watching out for each other. So thank you to everyone out there who's doing that. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Harrington. I, and I'm sure everybody else in this room, has had messages from people just checking in saying, how are you doing? You doing okay? Um, we appreciate, we know you're working hard or whatever. Those things give me a lot of hope and um, strength. I know that uh, we are a community and that, the, that as a community, we'll do more than the sum of, our, of us as individuals. And we all need to strive to continue that community sense. The stress level is only gonna continue. Kindness needs to be our operating word and let's uh, work, do this together. Have, have confidence in each other, be alarmed for your neighbor, mm -hmm. and reach out and take care of each other. We'll do this. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, and I do wanna continue to remind people to send your questions um, about COVID-19 for future panels to covid at steamboatsprings.net. You can also send questions to news at steamboatpilot.com. And those questions help us plan for future panels, and we will be continuing to do this. Um, I also, you all mentioned on um, a pos ending on a positive note, and um, we want to be sure our news is balanced and not all negative. So we've started doing a Yampa Valley silver lining in the paper, mm -hmm. and we're relying on the community to keep your eyes open. And if someone does something, a neighbor helping neighbor, a random act Great. of kindness, if you would send that to news at steamboatpilot.com, we'd like to publish one of those a day, online and in print, um, as a, another example. We know it's happening all over, and just uh, help us tell those positive stories. Great. So thank you all again, and um, I hope everyone has a great day. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. a random act Correct. of kindness if you would send that to news at steamboatpilot.com we'd like to publish one of those a day online and in print um, as a another example we know it's